Hi, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of Virtual Health Club. I am your host, Dr. Millie Lytle, and I will be leading the session today on five shifts to put your autoimmunity in remission. And this is a really uh, important topic. Definitely autoimmune disease is growing. We will look at some statistics. We will look at some statistics as we move through the um, program. And then also we'll look at, um, actually I'll just share my screen so that you can see the agenda of what we'll cover today. Bear with me for one minute. Here we go. So the title of today is Five Shifts to Put Your Autoimmune Condition in Remission. And autoimmunity is a very, very complicated set of, it's a process really that happens in the body and there is no consensus on how many autoimmune diseases there are because there seem to be new autoimmune diseases that develop over time and there are certainly states of autoimmunity that are not diagnosed. Um, oftentimes in a diagnosis for autoimmune disease, there's an antibody that is a specific biomarker in the blood that shows that your some part, some tissue in the body is attacking itself. And then the body raises a protective response to that, which is called an antibody. And then the antibody can get measured. So in the case of rheumatoid arthritis and Trogren's and scleroderma, there are known biomarkers. Um, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, there's known biomarkers that can be measured in the blood. Um, and we'll look at some biomarkers later. But then there are some diseases that do not have a biomarker, such as lupus. Lupus is an autoimmune disease that doesn't have a biomarker. And then it puts the disease in a category of confusion or at least debate within the medical system. And then it puts those of us who are looking at the body more holistically, understanding more actually what this process of autoimmunity is and what we, how we can predict it and how we can rectify it. So um, some of you might know that I'm the head of coaching for an autoimmune, autoimmune disease uh, health platform right now. So I lead their coaching department and we only take autoimmune disease patients and then we also take some 
patients who are like developing autoimmune disease or on the way to developing autoimmune diseases based on certain symptoms and results that they, they have gotten, even if they haven't been fully diagnosed. Because in many cases, it takes 10 or if not 20 years in order to develop a full-blown autoimmune disease. And during that time, when a person's undiagnosed, they're still suffering with all the major symptoms. So, okay, so we're gonna get into this. Also in New York, I feel like autoimmune disease is much more popular. Now maybe it's the time, but when I lived in Toronto, I didn't see as much autoimmune disease. Now here in New York, I see a lot more. I do, you know, autoimmune disease definitely has to do with stressors, has to do with how hard people work, how much they have to do to kind of keep a good lifestyle. Um, definitely has to do with pollution in some cases. And so the fact that we're living in this, you know, even though New York and some, some places in New York look clean, there's definitely a lot of chemicals and a lot of pollution that's going on. So it's possible just the fact that it's so big and there's so many cars and et cetera, um, that that's part of the reason as well. But, you know, we don't really know. We're just kind of, um, I'm just saying what I observed. So, okay, so the agenda today is how to recognize autoimmunity, what the symptoms are, what the key biomarkers are in the lab work, and then other um, non-biomarker indications for autoimmunity. I'm not going to go too deep into that, but just to show that there are some others. And then we'll go over common autoimmune diseases. But then, so as I mentioned, it's unknown really how many autoimmune diseases there are. The official number with the CDC is 20, in the 20s, 25 or so official autoimmune diseases, but some people, some statistics say that there's in the up, up above 100 different autoimmune diseases that we still don't have biomarkers for, that we still can't identify. Um, other related conditions, this is really important when we're looking at the holistic nature of it, because basically, if autoimmune disease is that the body is um, starting to attack itself based on triggers, then any tissue in the body could conceivably develop an autoimmune response where that tissue is, is attacking itself and destroying itself. And so this is where diseases are based on is like what tissue that's happening in. So with rheumatoid arthritis, it's the joints. With Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it's the thyroid. With lupus, it's multiple connective tissues, cartilage, lungs, kidneys. So it's a very complex disorder. And in and above that, there's no one specific biomarker. So this is where the complexity of autoimmune also gets, um, gets more so. So we'll talk about other related conditions. So that could be warning signs that also could be uh, concurrent with, they, they happen at the same time, or they tend to also happen alongside autoimmune disease, but they could also be predictive for an autoimmune disease developing, or even just that if you have the predictive conditions, then you can treat yourself like an autoimmune disease patient, even if you haven't received the diagnosis. Then we'll definitely be talking about five shifts to change your immune system to reverse your autoimmune disease or condition. And I'll be showing some products just briefly um, as to what we need in order to get our body's um, global health back. And then also I'll be talking about what's coming up next in the health club. Okay, so this is just some statistics. Hope you can see this, this is just a screenshot. This is from the AARDA, the American Autoimmune um, Disorder Association. And so this is autoimmune disease statistics. So 50 million Americans with an autoimmune disease. Now this is with a diagnosed autoimmune disease. There could be, now the, C, this, um, the CDC says that there's 25. So this is double what the CDC says. Now this organization, obviously they are defending and looking for autoimmune conditions, um, but that's a really big number. I mean, it's twice as much as the official CDC number. And also, there could be more because these are still um, diagnosed or uh, sus highly suspected. $591 million spent by the National Institute of Health on autoimmune disease research compared to $6.1 billion spent on cancer. So they're certainly um, spending uh, you know, a lot more on cancer 
and yet um, autoimmune diseases are rising. So common symptoms of autoimmune disease. So generally when people initially start to get an autoimmune disease or some initial warning signs of an autoimmune could generally fatigue. Now fatigue is a very non-specific symptom. So there could be specific, you know, somebody who has cancer could also get fatigue. Somebody who has a cold can get fatigue. Somebody who has different chronic conditions, not necessarily autoimmune related, can get fatigue. So fatigue is very nonspecific. However, the level of fatigue is definitely to be considered because if we're talking about just, it's not that um, I missed a night of sleep and so I'm tired. It's that maybe I never sleep well and therefore I'm always tired or even though I sleep for 10 or 12 or 16 hours a day, I'm still tired and I can't go to work and I can't pick up my children and I can't you know, make dinner and engage in um, my family's life. And so it can get from, fatigue can be a very mild symptom that's expected if you don't get enough sleep. But when we're talking about autoimmune diseases, we're talking about an excessive level of fatigue that cannot be recouped with sleep. There usually is also sleeping issues, maybe even from childhood, long-standing insomnia. So there can be all these kind of um, reasons for why there's so much fatigue. But anyway, let alone there is a lot of fatigue. Muscle aches and tenderness, joint pain and swelling. I, these are two separate things, but I put them on the same line because they're a little bit related and I want to I want everything to fit on the screen. Uh, trouble concentrating and brain fog is also very common. Um, just can't think clearly the way they used to, might find themselves making mistakes, searching for words. And these symptoms can be, can be very nonspecific. You know, you can go to your doctor and say, I have fatigue, I have muscle aches, joint pain, I have, you know, can't focus on my work anymore. And your doctor might run a whole bunch of tests and it might be normal. And, th and your tests could be normal for years and people could just basically, maybe they'll get recommended an antidepressant or maybe they'll get recommended, um, you know, Tylenol or an ibuprofen or an aspirin or something anti-inflammatory. And, but that doesn't stop the process that's going on in the body. So uh, there can also be skin problems. This is very uh, common. So there's rashes, there's hives, there's eczema. This could be since childhood. Uh, that there's these kind of atopic conditions. So maybe there was a history of asthma, eczema, that kind of childhood presentation, and then now a person's an adult. Children do get diagnosed with autoimmune diseases. Uh, we have a six-year-old who's just come in with her mother in our program. And also uh, we have a te several teenagers who have gone through as well. Um, other skin conditions are like there's burning sensations. So that could be nerves related, but it might be felt on the skin. So it feels like the skin's burning. It feels like the skin, it feels like there's a rash when there's not. There might be itching when there's no, there's just no rash. Um, wounds not healing. Now also wounds not healing can just be a nutrient deficiency. It doesn't mean there's autoimmune disease definitively, but we do see these types of, of symptoms. Or, you know, as soon as something heals, then there's something else that starts up again. Uh, abdominal pain and digestive issues with almost all autoimmune patients, they, they get gas and bloating, they might have constipation, they might experience IBS, they might have been diagnosed with IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome. Now, irritable bowel syndrome is what we call an enteric, an enteric nervous system condition. It's not an autoimmune disease. It simply means that stress has an impact on the digestive tract, and so people can get either constipation type, diarrhea type, or alternating constipation and diarrhea type irritable bowel syndrome. And this can kind of remit and come back and remit and come back. That's also a hallmark symptom of autoimmune diseases of all kinds is that symptoms flare and then remit. So there, you might be fine for a period of time and then there's a flare of some sort. So if it's like ulcerative ultra, ultra, ultra colitis or Crohn's disease, it's in the digestive tract. So there can be flares of like bleeding stool or diarrhea. You know, you have to go to the bathroom like 20 times a day and then um, it might go away. You might think you're fine for a period of time. Or if it's rheumatoid arthritis, there might be periods of flares, intense pain in the joints, stabbing pain, or intense aching um, pain that where it's crippling to walk. And then, and that could be in the hands, or that could be in the elbows, or the wrists, or the knees, um, or the feet. And, and then you can feel fine for a period of time, and then it can, it can come back. 
Um, recurring fevers, so fever for no reason, you might feel like you have a sore throat, swollen glands, cold symptoms, so you, you know, you could feel like you might have a virus, you might actually have a virus, there might be viral infections, frequent viral infections, or a viral infection you never re uh, recovered from. Um, hair loss is also a common symptom of both thyroid conditions, it could be thyroiditis, and, but then it also could be other autoimmune diseases. And just generally feeling unwell and feeling the need to push through. I find that autoimmune disease patients often feel like they need to push themselves. They need to push themselves to go to work. They need to push themselves to go to the gym. They need to push themselves to keep up with their previous lifestyle before they started feeling sick, even though they really don't feel like doing it. And um, uh, so those are the most common symptoms of autoimmune disease. It's a lot of symptoms, and that's this is one reason for why these conditions are so debilitating. So diagnostic tests and lab work, you might be familiar with some of these. Some of these are very technical. There's a lot of anti and the series of letters. And so, you know, don't, don't drive yourself crazy having to memorize these. But the hallmark uh, diagnostic test is called ANA. It's an anti-nuclear antibody test. And basically this means that it's a general um, catch uh, antibody test to see if the body is uh, reacting to itself. So it looks at the RNA um, you know, inside the nucleus of cells and see, to see if there's any uh, antibodies or any inflammation being um, resulted from antibodies, for the body is producing antibodies attacking to its own tissue. So generally, ANAs can test positive, and that means you have an autoimmune disease, and then they if you test positive for that, then they'll do a whole slew of other diagnostics to try to find a specific marker because ANA is not specific to any one disease. So you could have a positive ANA test. It's either positive or negative, and then it's different gradients. If it's negative, then likely you don't have an autoimmune disease, not yet. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not developing one, but more commonly what I see is, especially when people have the symptoms of an autoimmune condition, is that they Get, go for the ANA test, the test positive, and then they test negative to all the other antibodies. And so then there's no diagnosis possible. So we know that there's an autoimmune process happening, that there's autoimmune um, chronology happening in the body, but we don't know which autoimmune disease you have. And so therefore there's no diagnosis. And if there's no diagnosis, in many cases with medicine, the way it works, if there's no diagnosis, then there's no treatment. And so that's why it's kind of just a waiting around game to see, okay, if you develop a positive response antibody to any one of these other panels, then you might actually get a condition and then you would get treated. Now, getting diagnosed with an autoimmune disease also has its drawbacks because of course, medications that treat autoimmune diseases are very toxic. They come with a lot of side effects and they destroy organ systems. And I wasn't really planning on talking about biologics and chemotherapy, chemotherapy, but those are the classifications of medications that treat autoimmune disease. And so there's several categories of medications and different drugs based on different autoimmune diseases, but you know, methotrexate, Plaquenil, Humira, these would be common uh, medications that would be used to treat various um, autoimmune diseases, and they all have their toxicity levels, meaning they can only be used by an individual or taken for a certain period of time until an organ system like the liver or the kidneys start to uh, fail, and then they need to be taken off those medications due to side effects. Now, of course, some people can be on for longer, some people can shorter, and so these are all the issues also with why autoimmune diseases are so uh, concerning and why there is so much money being spent on developing um, drugs and new treatments and even alternative therapies. So, okay, so ANA, that would be the first one taken. Then they might run an anti-DS DNA. So this is looking at the, D the DNA inside the cell, also inside the nucleus, of the nucleus of the cell, part of the genetic material, to see if the body's responding to its own genetic material. Basically, that's what these two tests are, one and two, seeing if the cell is reacting to itself. Then there's something called an ENA panel. So if you are positive for an ANA, then your doctor might run an ENA panel, which is extractable nuclear anti 
antigen antibodies. And there's a series of these. These are not the only ones in this panel. There's about three others. Um, but basically, it's an anti-RNP. It's also ribonucleic acid, looking to see if um, RNAs are responding to, to, it, to itself, reacting to itself. There's a Sjogren's syndrome. There's two uh, antibodies that denote Sjogren's syndrome, uh, anti-SSA and anti-SSB. Then there's scleroderma antibodies, the anti-JO1. So these Sjogren's syndrome and scleroderma are two, both two autoimmune diseases. Then there's rheumatoid factor, which would be generally um, would be one along with anti DNA to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. And so if any of these were elevated or positive, then um, you might get a diagnosis. CCP also in, in rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes in lupus as well, cyclic citrullated peptide antibodies. Um, and then there's the thyroid antibodies, the anti-thyroid peroxidase antibody and the thyroglobulin antibody. And if these were high, then this would diagnose Hashimoto's, potentially Graves disease. Um, generally what happens, oftentimes what happens is somebody develops Graves disease, which is a hyperthyroid, and then some people just develop Hashimoto's, which is a hypothyroid. It's an inflammation that destroys the thyroid gland and then, um, then the thyroid gland doesn't work properly anymore and there's low thyroid. Whereas Graves disease is hyper reactive thyroid, but pretty, pretty soon the thyroid will burn out and stop being able to produce its, its um, hormones any longer. And so then Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism will result. Or sometimes they'll ablate the thyroid, they'll give radiation to the thyroid and they'll induce um, a hypothyroid state, even if it was a hyperthyroid. So um, this can happen with autoimmune disease or not, but if you have a positive TPO and thyroglobulin, then, then, um, then it's, anti it's autoimmune. Then diabetes type 1, which is usually um, developed and diagnosed in childhood. This is where the, the pancreas can no longer produce insulin. It's an, it's an antibody, the islet antibodies. Then there's the tissue transglutaminase antibody, which is in celiac disease and the deaminated gliadin peptide antibodies. So these are two antibodies that would test positive for celiac disease, which is, of course, an allergy to gluten. Um, but people have sensitivities to gluten who, who do not have celiac disease also, and this can lead to other autoimmune diseases, and so this is definitely something that we look for. Um, there's also other markers that show genetic issues with gluten, um, HLQ, uh, HLAQ, and uh, they're not antibodies, but they're markers, biomarkers that show that there's a genetic problem digesting gluten. Then, then also the doctor could do something in IgA, which is an immunoglobulin A, which shows inflammation at the mucosal lining, so at the tissue level. And so if there was, this was high enough, then they could also look further. Um, what is not on here, which I meant to have on here, is CRP, that's um, C-reactive protein, which is a measure of inflammation in the blood. So one can have high CRP if they have inflammation anywhere. So they could have heart disease and have high CRP. They could have osteoarthritis and have high CRP. They could have hepatitis or like a liver problem and have a high CRP. So it really indicates um, inflammation in the blood and doesn't need to be autoimmune, but generally autoimmune patients do have high CRP, and it's definitely an important thing to work on, and we can work on that nutritionally. And then the other indication of inflammation in the body is the SED rate, which is ESR, so erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is a measure of how red blood cells break down and how the kidney clears it. And so this is definitely a marker um, that they look to bring down with medications. Um, having a high SED rate can cause anemia uh, because it ruptures red blood cells prematurely. And so there's a whole lot of other problems like sequela issues that come along with having a high ESR. Uh, so they definitely test that. Here's some common autoimmune diagnoses. Now this specific study was in Italy um, that showed prevalence per uh, 100,000 people. Um, 12 autoimmune diseases, and these are the top ones, autoimmune thyroiditis, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, MS, that's multiple sclerosis, 
ulcerative colitis, which is considered an inflammatory bowel disease, not to be confused with IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, which is not autoimmune. Ulcerative colitis is an inflammatory bowel disease that is autoimmune. Um, celiac disease, allergy to gluten, lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. You might have heard it called SLE, lupus, myasthenia gravis, systemic sclerosis, or scleroderma, Sjogren's syndrome, and Crohn's disease, which is the second um, inflammatory bowel disease, along with ulcerative colitis. So those are the top other related or, oh no, sorry, this is actually other another slide. Um, sorry about the heading. This is another slide that is also lists um, the top autoimmune diseases in America. However, the reason I did not put this slide as the only one is because it's way back in 2008. So it's really not that recent. And this is a problem actually with a, quite a few quite a bit of the autoimmune disease research is that these statistics are way back in 2008. This is before biologics were developed, but um, so there's been lots of change in autoimmune research and just a, there's been growing numbers since then. But anyway, rheumatoid arthritis, um, Hashimoto's or and Graves, so that's a combination of thyroid autoimmune diseases. Vitiligo, which is, um, you know, sometimes they're called the, the Michael Jackson disease, is where you get loose pigment. Um, and end up with blotchy skin, pernicious anemia, which is when the red, uh, the red blood cells just burst kind of because of inflammation present, type one diabetes, myasthenia gravis, lupus, Sjogren, multiple sclerosis, and then other diseases. Okay. So other related or preceding conditions that increase the risk of autoimmune diseases. So these are other conditions that you might have heard of, you might not have heard of them, um, that are not technically autoimmune because one, there's no biomarker associated with it. However, there's no biomarker associated with lupus and it is an autoimmune disease. There's not necessarily any inflammation in these diseases, although something like interstitial cystitis, there is inflammation. So there might be inflammation, but there's no inflammation or biomarker in fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. So even though likely a large majority of patients who have autoimmune disease do have either fibromyalgia and or chronic fatigue syndrome. These two conditions on their own are not autoimmune. And they also might precede an autoimmune diagnosis. And they also just might, a person might just have fibromyalgia, it's not just, it's enough to have fibromyalgia and or chronic fatigue syndrome for a long period of time. And Everything that I'm saying in this presentation also relates, like the five shifts also relates to fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue because they do have similar um, development. So connective tissue disease, now to the connective tissue disease, you know, lupus is a connective tissue disease, so, or rheumatoid arthritis is a connective tissue disease, so these might be autoimmune, but they might not be chronic urticaria, chronic hives, people who get seasonal hives or hives all over their body or they don't know what they're allergic to, um, that can also precede autoimmune or be autoimmune. Chronic mono, having a high positive titers of Epstein-Barr. Now, the medical community does not acknowledge this. This is something that's very embedded in the naturopathic and functional medicine community. I'm always looking at Epstein-Barr levels, um, especially if somebody's never felt well since getting mono or if they had a recurrence. Of mono, oftentimes people will get mono when they're in college, you know, they're partying and they're not sleeping and they're pulling all-nighters and they're making out with a lot of people and there's just lots of germ spread. People will get sick with mono in college, but then it, it, they'll also get recurrences in their 30s. And so if people get recurrences of mono in their 30s or even 40s or later, and then those levels stay high, they never actually recover from it. So this is definitely a symptom. Also chronic, chronic Lyme disease, I also look at it like this. So same thing, you get bit by a tick, you get antibiotics, you recover from the Lyme disease, no big deal. But in some people, they develop chronic Lyme where they still have neurological symptoms, um, they still have, they have fatigue, they might have fevers, they have all the same symptoms as an autoimmune disease. It might be Lyme, it might not be Lyme, um, but it's, uh, it's definitely related to an autoimmune disease. Cytomegalovirus, and there could be other low-grade infections, parvovirus I've seen, 
I had an auto, I had a patient who didn't have an autoimmune diagnosis, but had all the symptoms and she had been bitten by something when she was a kid in Estonia, you know, a country where they might not necessarily have the same mosquitoes or bugs that we have here. So we just, it's just unknown. She just doesn't know what she had. And um, basically she's developed, you know, an, an autoimmune like condition, histamine intolerance, people who can't tolerate, um, leftovers or fermented foods or kombucha or yogurt or um, wine or vinegar, anything that's aged um, or even or seem to be allergic to their allergies, mast cell activation syndrome. This is also like a chronic histamine elevation or mast cell triggering, uh, which is a different type of inflammatory immune cell. Um, chronic UTIs, so always getting urinary tract infections, could be a yeast infection, urinary tract infection kind of cycle, interstitial cystitis also, which is not a bladder infection, but it's inflammation around the bladder. Men and women can both get that. Men can also get kind of chronic prostatitis, which also might be preceding risk for autoimmune diseases. However, statistics are that women are predominantly the ones who get autoimmune diseases. Um, so, but men do also get them. Leaky gut syndrome, this could be uh, infectious agents like parasites, whether or not you test positive at the doctor's office, if you've traveled, never been well since traveling, had traveler's diarrhea and didn't recover well. Um, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it's also a functional medicine diagnosis. Candida, more of a naturopathic diagnosis, which is an overgrowth of yeast or candidiasis, candida albicans in your intestines or in your vaginal tract. Um, so these types of conditions also precede autoimmune conditions and can are, go along with part of the treatment. And irritable bowel syndrome, as I've mentioned, oftentimes people will have IBS or some types of digestive issues, fructose intolerance, fructose malabsorption, not being able to handle sugar, not being able to digest any starches, uh, and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So even if somebody does not have celiac disease, they still can't tolerate bread, uh, it becomes addictive for them, they cannot digest it, it makes them depressed, makes them tired. And so um, these are all related or and or preceding and or concurrent uh, with autoimmune disease. So time for major change. If you have been experiencing these symptoms, if you have received any of these diagnoses, then um, then there's from a, a big picture perspective, there are several things that you can do to shift your body's response to its environment. Now that's not just its internal environment, whereas autoimmune is attacking yourself, but it's also considering the external environment, so what's going on around you. And so these are five big shifts, they're big categories, and this is not to overwhelm you at all. It's only to give you insight into what has maybe made you, made you ill in your life, what's not working for you, um, what you haven't you know, coped with or been able to do for yourself, and maybe times in your life where your health kind of fell off the rails and you didn't put it together that it was caused by a specific event or trigger. Because the one thing we do know about autoimmune conditions is that there are triggers. So. And, and a trigger can be a stressful event. A, a trigger can be having to take care of your sick mother, losing a child, having a sick child, going through a divorce, uh, poverty. Um, a trigger can be some kind of allergy, a car accident or an injury. Uh, a trigger can be any amount, any degree of childhood trauma or um, people who are vets who have gone abroad and witnessed horrible uh, war or even living in where you live and having witnessed something or for some people a trigger is their dog dying um, so and then for some people a trigger is not getting two nights of sleep or their parents coming to visit or somebody from their family coming to visit or food definitely lots of food and so some things we can't control you know we can't change our childhood we can't change what trauma we in, we've endured already in the past all that we can do is to try to reposition ourselves where we are so we can move forward feeling better about ourselves and our situation and more empowered. And so a lot of, of the shifts that I'm gonna talk about are hopefully meant to empower you 
as to what you can do differently in your own life. And so this generally comes as number five, but I'm going to put it number one because I, don't, I think if you're going to prioritize yourself, it has to be number one. And prioritizing yourself is absolutely crucial in shifting your mindset. Now, we all need to take care of people. We all feel that we can't um, you know, refuse or say no to people who need us, or we feel like they're our family, or they're our spouse, or they're our child. But we have to consider what's giving us energy and what's taking, us, taking energy from us. So when I say prioritize yourself, this could be in any area. Do you go, do you go to bed on time? Do you prioritize yourself, your, what you need in order to have a healthy lifestyle? Deep sleep. We are human beings. We need deep sleep. We need to go to bed before midnight. Some people say we need to go to bed at 10. So I, I more believe that. You know, We need to go to bed before midnight, or an hour before midnight, two hours before midnight. Do you prioritize your feelings? Do you express your feelings? Do you acknowledge your feelings? Do you, when you're feeling sad, angry, resentful, hurt, is that something that you can look at and acknowledge and sit with and release your pain? Can you, do you have support people? Can you just place your feelings ahead of other things sometimes? It's very important to be able to do this because we are, again, human. We need to be able to reflect on our emotions and uh, reflect about our experiences and also express ourselves. Now, expressing ourselves, we can get locked in expressing ourselves too. We can ex get locked in expressing negative feelings and always be feeling angry or bottling up and always feeling resentful or always feeling sad. And sometimes we express and express and express and it still doesn't make any change. So, if that's the case, also, then it's about looking at things differently. So when it comes to energy, prioritizing your energy, I think this is a really easy, simple trick to, sit, to consider anything, all things in your life that are coming into your own personal space. Does this give me energy or does this take energy away from me? Especially when we're dealing with condition like autoimmune, all these conditions of autoimmune, and it's so much about energy, so much about how the body is addressing itself. And what we let seep in to our, and affect us. And so if something is taking away energy from you all the time, I recommend getting rid of it from your life. Now that could be a person, that could be a family member, that could be the apartment you've been living in, that could be, that could be a, your wardrobe, that could be anything that makes you feel, oh, this is, you know, Maria Kondo, the magical tidying up. This is, this is your energy. What gives you energy? What makes you feel good? And what makes you feel good, you want to bring more of that into your life, whether it's people, whether it's a, going somewhere, whether it's spending time by yourself, whether it's spending time with others. Do more of what makes you feel good. Do less of what makes you feel drained. How you cope. Prioritize your coping mechanisms. If you, if you cope by eating the wrong food, sugar, uh, alcohol, coffee, uh, getting mad at, at people or hating yourself in some way, then you want to address that. And then your cycles, prioritize your cycles. So we, we all live in 24 hour body clock. We all live in a day and in a night. You know, if you're a shift worker, this can be very intense to change. And I know that if there's it can be, these can be big asks if you think that your work is what's killing you and you feel, you know, bound to work because it's your livelihood. So, you know, we all have to deal with this, but when it's your health, then we really have to take a more serious look and get more creative as to what we can do. Cycles can also mean menstrual cycles. Like, does it have, does your flares happen every time? Um, you know, your PMS or when your period comes on, or if it's men, men are on cycles too, definitely tune into Dr. Catherine Dale's talk next, um, next week, because she's going to be talking about men's cycles. So we are humans. We live in the cycle of the moon. We live in the cycle of the sun. We live in the cycle of the earth's rotations. We live in the seasons. Um, and so we have to, we want to give in to the cycles as much as possible so that we can get restored and get repleted. Clean up physical environment. This could be one of the easiest things to do. So I mentioned Maria, Maria Kondo, the magical tidying up. That's definitely this. But it's also just like switching your cleaning products. Get rid of the bleach, 
get rid of all the obesogens, all the toxins that are in, the, in your cabinet, all the fragrances, start using more natural, whether it's borax, vinegars, um, essential oils, biodegradable cleaning products, natural personal care products. Um, some people color their hair, go for manicures. We're around all of these chemicals all the time. So we want to think about what toxic chemicals we're around because those toxic chemicals are chemicals that our body has to detoxify and deal with. Perfumes, even, just, even if it, you think it's making you happy, maybe it's making you sick. So we want to consider how many chemicals, do an assessment of your house, but how many chemicals are you using on a daily basis? Because these chemicals are highly toxic. They're placing a massive burden on our body, on ourselves. And if your body thinks it's reacting to itself, but really it's reacting to the perfume you're using or to the hair dye that you're using or to the bleach that you're using or your laundry detergent, we can make massive shifts in, by cleaning that up. Can be medications, can be medications can be uh, recreational, can be, um, you know, cigarettes, definitely a massive trigger for autoimmune disease. Um, certain medications are as well. And so we want to consider everything that we're taking, everything that's around us, that's surrounding us. Our animals, as much, much as we love our cats, people are allergic to cats. And if you're allergic to cats and you have an autoimmune disease, then you're basically inviting inflammation, sources of inflammation and allergens into your bed, into your couch, all the dander all the time. And so you have to give your cat away. And I'm sorry to say that, but <laughs> you have to find another solution for um, you know, therapy, maybe a hypoallergenic cat or a hypoallergenic dog or something like that um, with hair, not with shedding. Toxic people. People are environment. If people drain us of energy, if people are mean to us, if people are abusive, then we cannot get healthy in that environment. Also a toxic job or workspace. I mentioned shift work, but if you hate your boss, you hate your coworkers, if you hate what you've been doing for the past 10 years or five years or one year or 50 years, you hate it, this is making you sick. So these are not simple changes and I recognize that, but at the same time, these are changes that are so profound and have such a profound reaction on how our cells express themselves and metabolize that these can be the key to, to going from sick to well. Clean up your diet. You thought you, I would never say it, right? <laughs> Eat a high nutrient, low calorie diet. And I do not mean low calorie food. I mean foods that do not, you know, come in boxes. Food that looks like it came from the farm. High nutrients, vegetables, fruit, um, meat, fish. If you're vegetarian, beans, whole grains. If you can tolerate grains, but in addition to eating high nutrient foods, we also want to recognize our food triggers. So some of these foods might not be tolerable. Every time you eat, if you eat lentils and you get bloated every time, that might not be the right food for you as healthy as they are. If you eat an apple and you get a tingly, spicy mouth, apples are not spicy, this is not the right food for you. It doesn't matter how healthy grapes are said to be, if they give you you know, a flush or a hot flash every time you eat them or alcohol, alcohol does that, that is not a food that you should be eating. So this is something that can be really something a lot easier to do with a health professional is to help determine what your food triggers are. Um, definitely also go back and listen to my elimination diet talk if this is something that you want help with, I, identifying your food triggers, because during that talk I gave an entire um, kind of solution to how you remove foods and then reintroduce them. You also want to get hydrated. Water is so important. Many people restrict water because they don't want to pee, but really we need to be flushing out our system all the time. If we're not drinking water, then we're not, kidneys aren't able to flush out waste products. We're not able to lubricate and moisten our stool to get rid of the bowel movements. It's a key to constipation. Even people who have Diarrhea, water is really important because then they're losing fluid all the time, losing even more fluid. And if you drink coffee, if you drink alcohol, if you drink tea, um, then these caffeinated and alcoholic beverages are just dehydrating soda, dehydrating you more. And so you need to drink more water. And you can flavor it with lemon, lime, apple cider vinegar, if you can tolerate it, um, cucumbers. So definitely important to clean up your diet, go more. You can, if you want to pick a diet, like a Mediterranean diet or 
you know, a modified paleo diet or modified keto diet, all of those kind of trendy diets, probably the Mediterranean diet is the unanimously, unanimously the most healthy diet in general, but we just do want to be aware of whether we're somebody who can tolerate carbohydrate, whether we can tolerate starch, whether we can, you know, um, can you eat shellfish and which foods are triggering you because some healthy foods can trigger you. Uh, especially nightshade vegetables. Those are a really common one, especially for anybody with rheumatoid problems. Um, those are potatoes and tomatoes and peppers of all types. Also tobaccos in that category. Artichokes and blueberries also cross-contaminate with nightshade vegetables. Um, wheat, buck, um, wheat, spelt, rye, those all have gluten in them, but for some people it's just processed wheat that they have a problem with. Dairy, major one, especially if you're lactose intolerant. If you're lactose intolerant and still eating dairy, you've got to cut it out because it's good. even cheese. Now, cheese has morphine in it, so or morphine derivatives, so that's why it's constipating. It doesn't cause loose stool, but it still doesn't mean that the body's not getting inflammation every time that you eat it. So you have to take responsibility um, or work with somebody who can help you with this because um, the foods that we're sensitive to also tend to grab a hold of our brain and make us want them more. And so there's a, it's an unhealthy, it's an uneven playing field when we go to eliminating because they are, we're, we do have to eliminate our favorite foods. You know, we have to eliminate sugar, which we love so much or um, something. And so it's much easier if you can see a professional, they can help you do it because once you get rid of that food, it no longer has a hold over you anymore and you can make massive changes and your health can massively improve. And you would go, you'll be surprised at how your mindset changes. You can go from thinking that you could never let go of a food to easily not eating it and never missing it and realizing that food is making you sick. You hate that food. It's like an ex lover. You do not want to see them ever again. You, you, you can get like that with food. Um, high histamine foods. So I mentioned before like alcohol or cured meats or vinegars or uh, leftovers, if you can't even eat leftovers, you know, if they've been in the fridge a couple of days and they make you sick after that, you have a histamine problem. Goitrogens, which be like raw kale, eat as healthy as it is. If you're juicing kale, it might not be uh, the right food for you. Um, eggs are highly allergic. And how many times do I have to mention alcohol? And, and the thing about alcohol is that it's filled, so it's high in histamine. It is the source that it comes from, you could be allergic to it. So you could be allergic to the you know, the grapes or the potatoes, if it's vodka or the, the beer, the gluten, the wheat from the, from the, in beer, then you could also be allergic to the yeast that they use to ferment it or brew it. And then you could also be allergic to the sulfates, like if it's in red wine. So, you know, they say red wine's so healthy, but red wine has so many different factors to it that you could be reacting to pesticides, um, it's estrogenic, it gives you a hot flash. So all of these little things that you think might be normal for you, might not be normal for you. It might really be that your body is telling you that that food is wrong. So if we've been eating the wrong food for us for periods of time, if we've been on many courses of antibiotics, if we've been on acid blockers, um, proton pump inhibitors like Zantac, ranitidine, uh, all these different PPIs and antacids, Tums, then, or if you've been constipated, if you have IBS, if you're, you know, if you're always bloated and gassy, then your gut needs to be healed. Your liver might also need some work detoxifying and also your gallbladder might need some work, especially if you've had a, if you, definitely if you've had a gallbladder removed, you need attention in your gut. So what heal the gut means is means sealing up the gaps so the cells are no longer spread out and we, you know, I've made a video about the road to good health is paved by good intestines and that's in the archives by now. So you can always go back and listen to that. Um, you have to purchase it by this time, but it is there if you want to learn all about how to heal the gut. But just um, in order to heal the gut, you want to reduce, remove your food triggers. You want to remove all the sources of inflammation that are going to destroy the cells. You want to primarily eat cooked foods, soups and stews, and foods where the minerals are still in the broth and that have glutamine, maybe from like bone broth or meat broth or fish even, um, sources of protein, food that digests very well. What food feels good? What, what food is both filling and help, 
allows you to be satisfied and doesn't give you bloatedness. So you want to uh, play around with what foods those are that make you feel well. Um, you definitely address constipation and diarrhea. If you're constipated, then you need to be increasing fiber, water, probiotics if you have diarrhea, or um, calcium if you have diarrhea, magnesium if you have constipation. So we want to play around with our electrolyte imbalance. Focus on bowel hygiene, giving yourself time to go to the bathroom every day. It's not okay to skip a day. And, you know, exercise also helps with this. We're sedentary, then we tend not to go to the bathroom. And some people just don't have good um, motility. Your, your kinetics are, are wrong. So whether that's because they've been trained through medications or just ignoring your signals, if you're a teacher and you've been, you know, or a nurse or a doctor and you've stood up all day and never give yourself time or if you were just not taught as a child or, you know, there's all sorts of reasons for why we don't pay attention and we've lost the signal to go to the bathroom, but it's really important to go to the bathroom. If you're going to the bathroom too much, then you're losing too many nutrients and too many electrolytes and too much water. And so then that also needs to be corrected. Um, and so in bowel hygiene, you know, sitting people, there's um, different like things that you can uh, put around the toilet, like steps, I forget what they're called, like, toilet jimmies or something. There's steps so that raises your knees because we don't really sit in a very ergonomically efficient way. Gravity doesn't work with us when we're sitting on the toilet, not to get too graphic, but um, it's really important. You know, some people need their knees above their chest when they're going to the bathroom, kind of more in squatting position. So there are like squatty potty things that you can buy or like put on your toilet or just even, you know, some people will stand up on the toilet seat just to help gravity um, so that you're not straining and giving yourself hemorrhoid or fissure or anything like that. So, and if you do have those, that can be very painful to go to the bathroom. And so, you know, we also want to heal those. And, and in order to heal those, we have to be not, not constipated and just going, or there's neurogenic bowel where people get a nerve pinch every time they poop and then that's very painful. So, um, you know, we have to ease the bowel movements with magnesium. And so there's a lot of things we can do. And we can, and that med coach, we have, you know, one-on-one, -on -one. if you need one-on-one -on -one support, we're here for that, but these are just general. Drink more water, absolutely, and detoxify. And so this could be helping to methylate. Maybe you're, you know, maybe you might have genetic SNP issues um, where you can't metabolize maybe estrogens or the goitrogens I was talking about or your B vitamins. And so um, there might be your liver's not working that well. Maybe if you're taken a lot of Tylenol in your life, your liver's not working very well, or if you have just a predisposition for poor detoxification, or if you've been around a lot of toxic exposure, then you might not be detoxifying well. So these are all also things to definitely um, pay attention to. And address nutrient depletions. This is number four. So these have been the, these are the five shifts. Um, prioritize yourself, clean up your physical environment, clean up your diet, Heal the gut, liver, and gallbladder included in there. If, you're, if you don't have a gallbladder or if your gallbladder, if you have stones or sand or anything in your gallbladder, then, you know, we need bile salts in order to help us break down our fats. It's really important. Address nutrient depletion. So if we, you know, we can, there can be so many reasons for why we're, we are deprived of nutrients. We might not eat enough, simple. We might not eat enough sources of nutrients in our food, especially if we've eaten the standard American diet. We do not have enough fruits and vegetables. And we're talking, you know, five to 10 servings, five minimum servings of vegetables per day, up to 10 servings of vegetables per day is what we need in order to maybe get the right amount of micronutrients in our diet, which is all the ABC vitamins, and then all of our minerals, magnesium, calcium, potassium, iron, uh, and then the trace minerals, more selenium and manganese and boron and all these minerals that we need for our bones and our muscles. And so there's all sorts of reasons in addition, though, to not eating enough for why we're depleted in nutrients. Maybe you exercise very hard and you sweat a lot. <laughs> Maybe you sweat a lot and you don't exercise very much. Maybe you are taking medications because every medication depletes some nutrient. If you're taking diuretics, you're depleting a lot of nutrients. If you're taking statins, you're depleting like, cholesterol medications, beta blockers, heart blood pressure medications, birth control pill, depleting nutrients. Histamine, antihistamines for your allergies, depleting nutrients. So every medication comes with side effects. And one of the reasons for why medications give us side effects is because they deplete these key nutrients that we need in order to maintain homeostasis, the body's good functioning. 
So if you know you're you know, low in vitamin D or you're borderline in vitamin D, it's extremely important for the immune system, for stabilizing the immune system. It's also important for healing the gut. Glutamine, it's a, an amino acid that's found in protein. It's found in um, like raw potato and cabbage juice. But if you don't want to drink raw potato and cabbage juice, then you could take bone broth or you could um, take glutamine as a powder or a bone broth powder. And these, this nutrient also amino acid goes to heal the cells of your intestine so that they're uh, close together and not letting toxins and proteins go back into your blood, giving you all of these chronic symptoms like migraines and depression and um, eczema. Magnesium and other electrolytes, other electrolytes being potassium, calcium, and phosphorus, usually it's low sodium. We need less sodium, so less table salt in our diet and less salt that's found in canned and fast foods, more magnesium, maybe more calcium. And you don't wanna take a whole lot of hard calcium tablets, but people who have diarrhea or very fast transit time, so you're, um, I do recommend calcium. Um, calcium can also help um, with too much acid in the stomach, although Tums is not the best method, but I would try magnesium first, especially if you're constipated, try magnesium because magnesium relaxes the bowels, it lowers blood pressure. Um, and these are minerals that we need a lot of and potassium, we need a lot of that. So unless you're on like a potassium spare, uh, sparing diuretic, spare lactone or something like that, then we all need at least four grams of potassium and a banana only has 400. So if you eat a banana a day, good for you because you're getting one tenth of your potassium amount. And potassium, um, I mean, I recommend isotonics, multivitamin, multivitamins and vitamins because they have electrolytes in them. So they have potassium in them. But as a pill, potassium is the only nutrient that we cannot get the RDI of, the recommended daily intake of over the counter. It's just the, the FDA regulates it like a drug, and um, you actually cannot get in pill form the minimum amount of potassium that we need on a daily basis. So many, many, many people are deficient in potassium, which lowers our blood pressure. And so you can never lower your salt too much in order for your blood pressure to be low as long as your minerals are low, your magnesium, your calcium, and your, and your potassium, because those need to balance out your sodium. So also sea salt, Himalayan salt, those types of salts do have all the minerals in them. And so whereas table salt only has sodium and chloride in it. And this is, this is a big trick with the, the food industry has pulled on Americans and Canadians um, is that we've been taking toxic salt for 50 years or something and it's been in everything. And yeah, they iodize it, they put iodine in it, which is naturally occurring in sea salt not in Himalayan salt, there's no iodine, but um, we haven't been eating the right kinds of salt, which contain all these minerals that help to balance our blood pressure, lower our blood pressure, and um, so definitely eat more of those. Probiotics, B12 and iron, so if we've been on antibiotics, we need probiotics, especially if we have traveler's diarrhea or any kind of antibiotic-associated diarrhea or just any kind of diarrhea, loose stool probiotics, even it helps with upset stomach, even if you have constipation and you've been on those medications and you also need probiotics, most of us do need probiotics and you can also eat food sources of probiotics. If you can tolerate fermented foods like sauerkraut, always found in the fridge, pickles, um, kombucha, et cetera. B12 and iron, so if you're anemic in any way, you definitely want to address those because those cause shortness of breath and fatigue. So those can just contribute to other autoimmune sim symptoms. Protein, especially in people, even if you do have kidney damage as a result of your autoimmune condition or as a result of other condition, we still need about, even for stage five kidney disease, we still need 0.7 grams per kilogram of body weight. So it could be, you know, if you still might need 30, depending on how much you weigh, you still might need 32 grams of protein per day. And a lot of people are getting way too little protein and afraid of protein because their doctors have scared them off protein. So we need protein to have energy to restore our cells. And with autoimmune disease, protein, um, you know, our cells are being destroyed all the time because of this self-attacking. Fatty acids, another thing goes back to the gallbladder. If we don't have a gallbladder, we can't break down our fats properly, then our body's never gonna liberate fatty acids, the omega-3s, the omega-9s, the good um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, never going to liberate those so that our body can use them. So you definitely you know, want to consider whether it's fish oils or flax seeds, um, chia seeds, other sources 
of omega-3s, um, wild salmon if you can get it, mackerel, albacore, tuna, sardines, and herring um, as good sources of omega-3s. And so any of those, if you're missing any of those nutrients in your diet, you can take those as vitamin products. If you're going to take D3, especially like 5,000 international units, I'd always recommend K2 with it because especially in autoimmune disease, it's been shown that vitamin K2 is deficient and it's needed. K2 is produced as a bacterial, as a bacterial fermentation in the gut from uh, vitamin K1, which is found in dark leafy greens. So if we're not eating enough dark leafy greens, we might not be getting enough K. And then with them, we'll not, if we don't have good bacteria in our intestine, then we won't be able to convert K1 to K2. And that's good for um, bones, osteoporosis, good for making sure that we don't get any side effects from excessive vitamin D or, or from um, calcium. And so vitamin K2 just kind of monitors vitamin D to make sure that it's going to the bones and going to the gut where it needs to be. Magnesium probably one of the most common deficiencies. We might need to replenish it, although it is found in root vegetables and you know, all leafy greens and animal products. Um, that, but we, many people still need to take magnesium supplementation. If you're gonna take vitamin B, B12, B complex, especially if you think you might have genetic issues like MTHFR or COMPT, um, and I did a whole uh, genetic um, session, of Health Club, which also can be found on the archives page, then you need activated or pre-methylated B-complex. And this means that the vitamins have already been methylated, so your body doesn't need to do that um, if you have a hard time metabolizing and using your B-complex. And you need those B-complex to produce serotonin, so for your moods, you need them to create energy in the Krebs cycle. Um, so this can be a big issue with, uh, you know, fatigue, if we're not, if our body's not able to use the nutrients that we're taking in order to produce energy, then we're going to get chronic fatigue and it's going to um, promote autoimmune more. Also very important for healing nerves, um, as is magnesium, both for, you know, in um, uh, Raynaud's disease or in neuropathy issues, um, so important. Probiotics, I didn't put fish oils, so but that's very important, protein powder. So I'll include some links to the products in the email that I send out if you're watching this as part of Health Club. If you're watching this after the fact, then you can always um, email to the list or you can go to our recommended products page at natmedcoach.com and you can um, get links to the recommended products. As a member of Health Club, then you get 15% off of our recommended products um, of the month. And then you get 10% off all other products. And so definitely make sure that you go there and catch that deal. Coming up on Wednesday, October 16th, we have community coaching Q&A. So you can tune in, you can come on and get any questions that you have answered uh, regarding this session, regarding um, any session that I've coached or any health condition that you might have, or if you wanna ask about how to do something, how to change your diet, how to clean up your, um, you know, your kitchen or your laundry room. Um, if you want to ask questions about somebody in your family or about supplementation or about any other symptoms, um, you can tune in. We do it for about a half an hour. Generally, it's uh, just a couple of us on there. And so I encourage people to come out to use that time because it's definitely a perk of health club that you get to speak to a naturopathic doctor at least twice a month. Um, and then on October 22nd at noon, we've got Dr. Catherine Dale back. She talked about uh, the moon and menstrual cycles, PMS and CBD last month. And then she's back this time because we do want to start focusing a little bit more on our male members. Um, she's going to be talking about healthy cycles for men. So of course, men are also human beings who live on a 24 hour body clock. They do have cycles in their life. And she's going to be talking about uh, men and healthy cycles for men and how men can abide by our natural cycles so that they can feel healthy and well. So I'm excited to have Dr. Catherine Dale back. And then at the end of the month on October 28th, we've got part one of a two-part food allergy testing. Um, Dr. Uh, no, she's not a doctor. She's a health coach, Judy DiMaggio. She's also studying functional medicine. And so she will be 
presenting. She's our allergy expert. She's, she'll be presenting food allergy testing part one. Her part two will be in uh, mid-November, I think November 13th, actually. She's going to be doing it at 7 p.m., so we're going to try out an evening. Um, so I've just kind of raced through. I'm wondering, are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? Let's stop sharing. No, I just want to say thanks for covering that, Dr. Billy. Very interesting. Yeah, you're welcome, Delia. I hope you can use the information. Yeah, I'm going to order and then listen through and then if I have any questions, because it was a, a lot. It's a um, lot, I know. As yeah. like everything that I, you know, it's always a lot of information, but. Mm -hmm. um, but that's good, that's good. Yeah, so, and if it's just, relevant to you and you know, what I want to do is like, so that you're building on your information so that you can, you know, understand yeah. more over time. But, so, uh, you know, I'll listen to it, it and if I have any questions, then I'll ask it during um, one of the coaching sessions. Okay, but, yeah, sounds yeah. good. Yeah, so, so if you're a member of Health Club, then you get access to this replay for 30 days, or if you mm -hmm. purchased it separately, a couple of people did um, purchase it separately, then you have access for 30 days. Otherwise, if you um, have purchased it, then it's a download. And it goes into the archive section after a month mm -hmm. and right away for anybody who's not a member of Health Club. So I want to thank you for tuning yeah. in. Thanks. And we'll see you the next time. Okay. Take care.